Thank you, Rabbi Ariel Makach Rosenberg. Thank you to all of you for being here. I I knew that I would be unable to connect with the mitzvah of joy on Purim without an explicit opportunity to mourn, to rage, to pray, to be in community, calling out. praying for the soul of my people, praying for all who have been lost and for all who are in harm's way. So I really just, you know, selfishly um, wanted to um, to help make this happen. And um, I'm grateful that you're all here to do this practice together. The Kav HaYashar, who was a 16th century um, Musar, a Kabbalistic ethicist um, uh, talks about this day, um, this practice of the fast of Esther, um, not being not just about what we're each doing with our own individual bodies, um, but he wrote that um, that everyone gathers for the fast of Esther, and village dwellers come to the city to recite prayers of repentance and supplication. Therefore, this day was established the reciting of prayers of penitence, repentance and supplication. Village dwellers are obliged to come to the city on the fast of Esther so that they may join with their fellow Jews in the reciting of the penitential prayers. For this is, okay, wait, sorry, skip, skip. The Holy One loves when people gather. 
in the cities to recite penitential prayers with the congregation. This is because in a multitude of people is the glory of the king. The Kaddish Baruch Hu, the only king uh, that we worship. Through these prayers, they arouse abundant mercy on the part of the heavenly host. So King Yeretzon may our gathering, just our gathering alone, let alone the Torah and the liturgy and the testimony that we will, um, that we'll be blessed with uh, today may, may even, even just our gathering um, arouse abundant mercy from the, the one who makes peace above um, and below. So I'm really honored uh, to, to invite our first guest uh, to share some words of Torah, Rabbi, Rabbi Dr. Arya Cohen, a uh, longtime professor of Talmud um, at uh, American Jewish University um, in Los Angeles. If you don't have his Justice in the City uh, book, highly recommend it. Long time, uh, long time activist um, on issues of war and racial justice and beyond. Um, so I'll pass it to Arya for some for some Torah. Have we found you yet? There you are. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rabbi Alana, for, for bringing us together, for organizing, and for all you do to actually make a world of, of peace. Injustice. Um, so uh, I will try to share my screen. I can't share my screen. Um, we can uh, make that possible. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you so much. So um, what I want to talk about is Purim. Um, this year Purim is, is a, you know, this year Purim is, is even more, it seems to be that there's always something happening around Purim that makes the celebration of Purim problematic. And this year, even more so last year, Hawara happened just before Purim, um, other year, I mean, going back to more, you know, Baruch Goldstein slaughtered 25 Palestinians on Purim in the Marat um, And so Purim has always been problematic. And what I want to suggest today is that Purim itself is essentially problematic. Um, the reason, and the reason it has become a kind of a festival for children, a kids festival, is because uh, it's a way of not dealing with the essential problematics of Purim, with the essential darkness of Purim. I used to think of it as for lo longer talk. I used to think of the Purim Tisha B'Av axis as opposed to the Hanukkah Passover axis, which is the possibility of redemption. The Purim Tisha B'Av axis is what happens in the impossibility of redemption. And so I want to go through um, some, I want to go through the Megillah story and some uh, some uh, quotes from Talmud, from mainly from Rava, um, who changes the character of Purim explicitly. Um, and Rava is important because Rava was one of the central sages of the Babylonian Jewish community, one of the central Amoraim in the, the fourth generation of Amoraim. The Rav and Shmuel started the Babylonian academies, and uh, Rava was uh, three generations after him, more or less. Um, and he has a very strong diasporic Torah. Uh, and he he can't go into it now, but take my word for it. He has a very strong diasporic Torah. And I think that that's one of the things that informs his understanding of, of Purim. Um, and we'll go through a number of his statements about Purim. The first chapter of the tractate Purim in the Babylonian Talmud, is most of it is a midrash on Megillat Esther. It's a you know, rabbinic interpretation of Megillat Esther. Um, there's a lot there, and as the 
high priest said on, used to say on Yom Kippur after he read from the Torah, he said, more than I read to you is there. So there is much more here. So um, this is Rabbah's revolution. There are four obligations um, that are written in the Megillah, which we follow every year. One is reading the Megillah itself. Another is Matanot Levyonim, um, giving presents to the poor. Um, Mishloach Manot, giving presents to our friends. Um, and Sudat Purim. Um, those four things are in the in the uh, in the Megillah itself. Rava adds this one thing: um, A person is obligated to become intoxicated with wine on Purim. So until he is so intoxicated that he does not know how to distinguish between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. So the, there are two questions that arise from here. Everybody knows that people get drunk on Purim or they drink something or this is the Rambam, the arch-rationalist, Maimonides, the arch-rationalist, had strong problems with this um, commandment. And he said, you could drink a little bit and go to sleep. And then you don't know the difference between Achashver, between Mordechai and Haman when you're asleep. But in general, this notion of, of getting drunk on Purim is well known. But what does it mean to get drunk until you don't know between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai? There are two questions there. One is that this is not getting buzzed. It's not even getting smashed. If there's a level of, of uh, you know, of getting beyond the consciousness. Um, so drunk that you can't tell the difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. And why specifically those two things, those two people? Mordechai and Haman, in the, the way the story is told, in the narrative, are the hero and the anti-hero are the two poles of the story. Why is it that the obligation is to not know the difference between the two of them? And so that's what we're going to explore in this, this short talk. Um, so here's the Esther story in 30 seconds or so. We know that the first chapter, there's the party, uh, 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 throws a party, summons his, his queen Vashti, she refuses to come, he exiles her, banishes her, kills her, unclear. Um, then chapter two starts with sometimes afterwards, when the anger of Ahasuerus abated, he thought of Vashti, what she had done and what he had, what had been decreed against her. So he does the only obvious thing. He has a beauty contest to choose a new queen. Um, and so, I'm sorry, went ahead too fast. Sometime afterwards, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, son of Hamdata the Agagite. Right? He promoted, he advanced him, seated him higher than any of his fellow officials, all the king's courtiers. In the, gala, gal, in the palace gate, knelt and bowed low to Haman, for such was the king's order concerning him, but Mordechai would not kneel or bow low. So here we have the first interaction, the first conflict between Mordechai and Haman, and Mordechai and Haman are seemingly on a similar, on the same plane. Now we're going to have these uh, little uh, notes about where Mordechai and Haman are, going to go throughout our reading of the, of the Megillah here. Mordechai and Haman are even, Haman was, was given this high and mighty Stature and Mordechai didn't care. Now, what's interesting to note here is that in Hebrew school, a lot of people are told that Mordechai wouldn't bow down to Haman either because Jews don't bow down to, you know, rulers, which is obviously not true. Um, there's a blessing to say when you see a, a king of a foreign country. Um, also, uh, it says there, you know, there's another actually Midrashic interpretation that Haman wore a an idol around his neck. Neither of those things are in the Megillah itself. So Mordechai and Haman were at each other's throat. Haman was thrown into a rage because of this, because Mordechai wouldn't bow before him. And therefore, the, thereupon, and there, Haman gave the king a whole bunch of money, and the king removed his signet from his hand and gave it to Haman, son of Haman Data, the Agai, the foe of the Jews. And the king said, the money and the people are yours to do with as you see fit. And of course, what Haman did was he wrote instructions to destroy, massacre, and exterminate all the Jews, young and old, children and women, on a single day. Keep those verses, those phrases in mind, because they will come back. So here we see on the side, Haman on top, Mordechai on the bottom. We go through the Megillah, Mordechai saves the king's life. Um, then the king realizes that nobody, that Mordechai has not been rewarded for saving the king's life. So the king, in one of the, one of the many ironies in the Megillah, one of the many reversals in the Megillah, asks Haman how to reward somebody who the king really likes. Haman says, dress him up as, you know, and the king's horse with the king's clothing, and the king says, do this to Mordechai. 
Um, and this, and he has to lead Mordechai through the street, and this really pisses Haman off. And he says, yet all this means nothing when he goes home. He says, all this means nothing every time I see that Jew Mordechai sitting in the palace gate. Let a stake be put up 50 cubits high, and in the morning, ask the king to have Mordechai impaled on it, and the proposal please Haman. So here, Mordechai was being led through the streets on the king's horse in the king's robes, and yet he was actually a dead man walking. So he's on the side. Here, Haman is on top with the, the stake, and Mordechai is a dead man walking. That night, the sleep deserted the king. Actually, this is where the, the whole garb and the horse um, and do this to Mordechai the Jew who sits in the king's gate. I mean, nothing of all you had proposed. And here, Mordechai is on top and Haman's on the bottom for a bit. And then um, Esther throws two parties. The first one, she throws the first one just in order to get the king and Haman to the second one. And Haman's all feeling really good about the fact that the queen's inviting him. And then Esther... Um, accuses Haman of wanting to destroy her and her people. Um, and there is the worst political decision in the history of political decisions. Haman decides to throw himself on Esther to beg for his life. And the king comes back in as Haman is on top of his queen, which does not help him. And they impaled Haman on the stake, which he had put up for Mordechai and the king's anger abated. Mordechai on top, Haman dead. Then what happens is the king slipped off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gives it to Mordechai, right? And Esther put Mordechai in charge of Haman's property. Mordechai gets the role that Haman has just been kicked out of. Um, and then what happens, so that's the first thing. So now Mordechai gets the ring. And then Mordechai um, had uh, orders written in the name of the king Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet. Letters were dispatched to this effect. The king had permitted the Jews of every city to assemble and fight for their lives. If any people of promise to tax them, what happens? They may destroy, plunder, and exterminate its armed force together with women and children and plunder their possessions. The same exact language that we saw in chapter 3, that Haman, when Haman got the ring, he wrote to destroy, massacre, and exterminate the Jews. When, when Mordechai got the ring, he wrote um, to destroy, massacre, and exterminate all the non-Jews, the other people. Um, and then Esther says, let the Jews and Jews not be permitted to act tomorrow, also as they did today, um, and they do the massacre one more time. And um, yeah. So here we see two things. One is that the question is the destabilization of the narrative, lo looking at it as we did, with the fact that the language repeats itself when Mordecai gets in charge, is what happens in the chapter after Pur after the Megillah is over, so keep that in the back of your mind. Also, why is Mordechai, is this, is this that we noted that Mordechai and Haman are actually the two conflicting, the tension between them are the two conflicting powers in the Megillah. So we take a look at them at, 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 the, at the Talmud and we find something interesting. This is the first Rava comment that we're gonna see after the first one. Kari le Yehudi, Alma mi Yehuda kai, so the Gemara asks, you know, classic Gemara question, there's a contradiction because Mordechai is called Mordechai HaYehudi, which can be understood as from the tribe of Judah. And Mordechai is also called Ishimini, from the tribe of Benjamin. So how could he be both from the tribe of Judah and from the tribe of Benjamin? So there are a couple of answers. And here's Rabbah's answer. So there, before this, there were answers that said that this was in praise of Mordechai, but Rabbah says no. This is the community of Israel who is saying this, the opposite, vice versa. That is not good. See what a Jew has done for me and what a Benjaminite has repaid me. What has a Judite Jude, Jude, done to me? For David didn't kill Shimi ben Gera. Long ago, sorry. But because of that, if David had killed Shimon ben Gera, he wouldn't have, Mordechai would not have been born. Who became jealous of Haman, who begaram tsarali Israel and caused grief to Israel. If Mordechai hadn't been born, who became jealous of Haman and caused grief to Israel, then this thing wouldn't have happened. The Benjaminite has repaid me. Kill Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Shil Malay Katle Shaul Agag Lahabi Mijalid Haman, that if Shaul hadn't had killed Agag, Haman 
would not have been born. So this is one of the ways in which the at least Rabbah is saying Mordechai and Haman are equivalent in that both of them seemingly cause this awfulness that could that might that almost happened to Israel. Right? That that Mordechai was jealous of Haman and therefore started this battle between them. And then Haman took it up and tried to kill, tried to kill the Jews. So well, this is just a, a framing of the whole thing. This is uh, chapter one, verse two. In those days when the king sat. So Rava plays on the word Shevet, which means when the king sat or reigned, but also uh, could also mean, as he says, I'm a Rava, my Keshevet. What does it mean? When his mind became settled. Now, why did his mind became settled? Amar Belshazzar Belshazzar, in the time of Daniel, made an, a, a, a calculation that the exile should have been over, but the Jews weren't redeemed. So therefore, he took out the vessels of the temple and made a large party. Um, and that's when Dan, that's when the, the writing on the wall appeared. If you all know the story of Daniel, one of the, you know, written in Aramaic, so everybody can understand it. Um, so, Ana Chashev I, Achashverosh, made a calculation. I didn't make a mistake, and therefore, we are at the moment after redemption should have happened, and redemption didn't happen. And um, there's a lot of ways in which Esther is based on Daniel, or maybe the opposite, depending on when they were written. Um, and uh, the, there, there's a Midrash, actually, that connects it to, and it says that in the first chapter, Kelim Mi Kelim Shonim, that Achashverosh put out different vessels, says that those were the vessels of the temple, making the explicit connection between this and, and, and Belshazzar's. Feast, but the important thing is that this is this whole thing is happening on the moment after redemption should have happened. And if you, there's a lot of math trying to prove that. Then we come to Rabbi's statement that we started with. Mordechai, and as if to tell us that he has become intoxicated, that he does not know how to distinguish between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai, as if we and if we thought that this was something that is just kind of just get happy. This the story is immediately told told after the statement. Rabbah and Rabzera made a Purim feast together. They got drunk. Rabba rose, slaughtered Rabzera. On the morrow, when the wine had left him, he, that is Rabbah, asked for mercy on Rabzera and he revived him. As he prayed for him, did something, and, and Rabzera came back from the dead. A year later, he said to him, the gentleman should come and we will do a Purim feast together, and then proving that the rabbis are not idiots. He said to him, Not in every hour does a miracle happen. Maybe, maybe we won't do that. Um, but the interest, the important thing here is that we know this is connected because this verb, which says, let us, uh, you know, that they got drunk is exactly the verb that's used in the Rava statement. So this drunkenness is not just a frivolity or a, a getting blasted. It's getting, it's a, it's a, it's a drunkenness that can lead to slaughter. Okay. So, so what's going on here with the, um, with this statement, what I think we see here is that Haman and Mordechai were locked in this battle, which wasn't based on anything except for power, according to Rub. Right, that Mordechai was jealous of Haman. Haman was angry at Mordechai, and their so their struggle was a struggle which was beyond. Ethics beyond what you know beyond morals. Now, one more statement that that brings this home. Rabba Amar Bishlama Hatam Halu Abde Hashem Lo Abde Paro El Hacha Halu Abde Hashem Lo Abde Hashverosh Kati Abde Hashverosh Ana. This is answering the question in halacha discussion. Why don't we say Halal on Purim the same way we say Halal on Pesach and actually say Halal on every holiday? But why do we say Halal on Purim uh, on Pesach and not on Purim. And the answer is because on Pesach, on Passover, we can say Halu of Deshem, which is a which is a, 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 one of the Psalms that we say in Hallel, give praise, O servants of God, and understand that that it means servants of God and not servants of Pharaoh. But we can't say that on Purim because we can't say give praise to servants of God and not servants of Ahasuerosh, because we are still servants of Ahasuerosh. Now, I, th I think, I will, I want to claim that we are still servants of Ahasuerosh, both in the time of the Megillah, 
and in the time of Rava, they still lived in Persia. So, and also metaphorically nowadays, as we have not overthrown the regime of Ahasuerus, we are still living in the regime of Ahasuerus. So, what is the regime of Ahasuerus? The regime of Ahasuerus is when it is Ahasuerus who has the ring, and everybody else is fighting for power. So if the if Ahasuerus is still there, and this coming back to the question, what happens in the next chapter of the Megillah? Obviously, in the next chapter of the Megillah, Haman or some other Haman gets the ring from Ahasuerus and wants to kill the Jews. And then Mordechai gets the ring and wants to kill the non-Jews. The system is premised on the fact that Ahasuerus controls the ring and that everybody else is just trying to bribe Ahasuerus to get the ring. There's no... There's, it's not a it's not a just system. It's actually a system of systemic oppression, which only benefits Ahasuerus. So I want to say that this also the 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 idea that one side is going to that you know that that Mordechai is going to kill enough of the you know the Hamanites, the uh, kill enough of the Persians, so that they won't be able to kill the Jews is ridiculous because in the language of the the Megillah and the language of the Gemara, anan, uh, you know, an, an we are still in that system where we try to think that might makes right. It's until we stop that system, until we stop, until we get out of the cycle that whoever has the more arms, whoever uses the more violence, whoever kills more people will actually win and get into a system where we take down Ahasuerus. We take down the entire system of thinking that the way to get to peace is by killing more people and bribing Ahasuerus. And we understand that the only way to stop the violence is by stopping the violence. And the only way to stop war is by stopping war. We will be in this endless cycle of Haman, Mordechai, Mordechai, Haman, Haman, Mordechai, Mordechai, Haman. Hopefully, we will get out of it. Pimhera, I mean. Thank you so much, Rev. Arie. We're holding this space open for learning and for practice, giving ourselves a chance to to, to do the spiritual work also of Tani Esther, of this fast of Esther. And pulling from the same teaching that Rabbi Ilana started with, from the Kav Yashar, I want to offer Psalm 22 as an opportunity for us to practice and an opportunity for us as a community gathering in this temporary space um, to really pour our intention and our focus towards a redemption and a mercy and a justice and an end of oppression. Um, the Kav Yashar teaches that it's the work on Tanit Esther to invoke our mythic ancestors, to invoke Mordechai and Esther, and to draw them closer. So that way, the generations that have been pushing for justice, the generations that have been imagining a world beyond the world in which we live, can join together on this day and open the gates of mercy. And the Kav Yashar teaches that we begin by reciting Psalm 22, which invokes or makes reference to Esther. And in opening with Psalm 22, we then open the space for us to pour our whole hearts out and make our specific requests, the requests of this moment, of this Purim, of this fast. And so I want uh, to invite us into that practice I'll chant the first and the last verses of Psalm 22, and I want to invite us as a community to pour our hearts out um, to invoke the ancestors who have taught us what it means to stay in the struggle, what it means to find community, what it means to dream beyond the limits of this time, um, and to focus our minds on an end to this catastrophic violence. What could it mean this year, in this moment, for each of us in our lives? and in relationship to the atrocities in Gaza, the continued captivity of hostages, and this massive division and conflict within our people to dedicate this day to transformation. So I'm going to share the words of, of, the, of the psalm that I'll be chanting in the chat if you want to chant with me or if you want to focus 
and really focus your own prayers, your own intentions. You're welcome to do that as well. Ya la 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 ya ya la la ya 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 la la ya 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 la 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 ya ya la ya ya la la ya 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 la la ya yo Lam natseach ala yelet ha-shachar mizmol David. Eli, Eli, lama zavtani? Rachok mishuati divre shagati. Elohai ekra yomam velo tane. Velayla velo dumiali. Ve'ata kadosh yoshev tilot Yisrael Becha batchu avotenu Batchu vatfal temo Elecha zaku venimlatu Becha batchu velo voshu Vanochi tolat velo ish Chepat adam uvezuyam Kol roi alikuli Yaftiru vasafa yani urosh Gol el Adonai yefaletehu Yatzilehu ki chafetz po Ki atagohi mi baten Mavtichi al shedeimi Alecha shlachti merachem Mi beteni mi eliata Al tirchak mi meni Ki tzara krova Ki en ozer Yalalaylaya Ya la la ya 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 yo ya la ya yo ya yo lo ya la la ya 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 yo. Yochlu anavim veizbau Yalelu Adonai dorshav Yechi levav chemlad Yizkeru veyashuvu El Adonai kol av searetz Vishtachavu lefanecha Kol mishpechot goyim Ki l'Adonai hamelucha Umoshel bagoyim Ochlu veishtachavu Kol dishne aretz Lefanav yichreu Kol yorde afar Venafsho lochia Zera yavdenu Yesupar l'adonai l'ador Yavohu veyagidu tzidkato Le'am nolad ki asa Yalalai ayo Yalalai ayo Thank you so much, Rabbi Ariel. Pass it over to our friend, Joel Carmel, who's the advocacy director, right? So advocacy coordinator at um, Shavrim Shtika, uh, Breaking the Silence. 
um, to offer some some testimony. Thank you so much, Joel, for being here. Hi, can everyone hear me? Um, thanks very much, first of all, for this invitation. Um, I'm speaking to you from my home in Jerusalem, and I, uh, so I'm coming to the end of my fast today, Tani uh, Tester, and I feel like uh, I needed something like this. So um, uh, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about Purim, <laughs> and um, I have uh, decided that this year I'll be, I, I always read uh, some of the Megillah um, uh, in my community, in my shul, and uh, I decided that th this year I'll be reading my part in the uh, Tamim, the tune of Megillah Teicha, uh, which is a tradition that already exists for certain um, verses, but I think I'm going to be doing my whole chapter um, in that tune because I feel like this is a moment, uh, kind of like the breaking of a glass uh, under a kupa. Um, there's a necessity to um, remember the pain of what's going on around us, even uh, as we celebrate. Um, so um, I'm I'm Joel Carmel. I you can hear from my accent that I grew up in the UK. Uh, I'm from London originally. Um, I grew up very much at the heart of the Jewish community, and uh, it was very obvious to me from a young age that I would uh, find myself in Israel. I saw Israel always as my home. Um, and I um, made the decision when I was about 16 or 17 that I didn't want um, this kind of abstract future of Israel to be so abstract anymore. Uh, and I decided that I would um, make Aliyah, meaning uh, immigrate to Israel, uh, immediately after high school uh, when I was 18. And that's what I did. I packed a bag. I went to study in a yeshiva uh, in the north of Israel and um, and then officially made Aliyah. Um, and uh, it wasn't long. I mean, there were obviously bureaucratic things along the way, but it wasn't long before I found myself uh, uh, in IDF uniform. I was never a very uh, kind of like machoistic person. I didn't um, uh, join the IDF because I saw myself as a, a great warrior or something, but I, um, I I saw this as my obligation, just like, you know, my fellow Israeli brothers and sisters who are conscripted to the IDF. I wanted to be part of Israeli society. Um, and I, uh, so I was about 20, yeah, 20 years old when I uh, was drafted and I was sent to a unit called Kogat, which stands for Co Coordination of Government Activities in the Territories. Um, and it's interestingly, Kogat is often a unit that is um, better known abroad than inside Israel itself, um, because it's the unit that deals with uh, managing the occupation, basically. Um, all of the bureaucracy uh, and uh, the de facto government, basically, of uh, much of the West Bank, um, dealing with all of the day-to-day -day, um, issues of, you know, how to how to run a place, uh, which in the West Bank is uh, the, under the direct control of uh, the IDF, uh, and in Gaza also, but indirectly. Uh, so I was um, sent to, uh, my first year was on uh, a base on the, um, on the border of Gaza, the Ares Crossing, uh, which is um, uh, uh, it was uh, actually one of the bases that was um, breached on the 7th of October. Uh, and I understand today it doesn't exist anymore, completely destroyed. Uh, and a couple of the soldiers who were there at the time were, were actually taken hostage. Um, and uh, so I spent about 10 months there dealing with uh, permits for people to enter and leave Gaza. Um, which is uh, for the very, very lucky few. Um, at the time, there was something like maybe 400 people a day allowed through, um, which is VIPs, aid workers, um, and people with um, very specific uh, diseases and illnesses that they needed 
um, medical treatment for in Israeli hospitals. Um, but again, th this was uh, at the areas crossing, which was built with a capacity for something like 40,000 people to go through a day. Uh, and in practice, it was more like 400. Um, uh, and after those 10 months, I was sent to officer's training course and later became a, a, an officer and, and was posted in the uh, West Bank uh, in the Janine district, which is the Northern West Bank. Um, and there I was uh, again in charge of movement permits, uh, this time for Palestinians living in the Janine district to enter and exit Israel. Um, and it was a striking difference from going from uh, Gaza, which is uh, it, it's at the time was completely cut off from us. Uh, we couldn't see uh, any of the Gazan population, and um, uh, and going from that to officers training course, and then to being the person who overnight uh, from being a cadet to being the person in, in charge of or responsible for the freedom of movement of tens of thousands of people um, was a, a huge responsibility on my shoulders and a, a big shift in, in my life. Uh, suddenly feeling like I was uh, someone who a lot of people were relying on. Um, and I, I think that's it's something to reflect on here because we were, you know, this the theme of this uh, event is violence and um uh and there's something about being the person in the uh you know in like in the bureaucracy uh in the office who stamps the permits and either says yes or no which feels very um kind of detached and in in practice that violence is although physically maybe not uh, nothing special but it's a very significant type of violence um uh, disrupting people's lives, making it impossible for people to, uh, you know, live their full lives, see family members, get uh, the medical treatment that they sometimes needed, uh, being able to make a living, all of those things were suddenly things that I had responsibility over, uh, even in, from my position as a very low ranking officer in the IDF. Um, but I think for me, the uh, turning point was when I um one night I was I was on my base and this base was shared between us and civil administration which is the subunit of Kogat that uh, runs the West Bank uh, and the other unit on our base was uh, a, a unit of border police and um, I heard one day that these border police um, or this company of border police was uh, given what's called a mapping mission uh, they were sent uh, uh, to go into a village uh, and I, I asked if I could um, join them because I was curious uh, and I kind of wanted to see what that looked like. I'd heard about it and I wanted to experience it for myself and I had at the back of my mind that um, I'm a good person and maybe I could be, I could have uh, some kind of influence over the, the other uh, border police soldiers um, and I, I asked to join and they said, no problem. And I found myself very late that night, maybe 12, 30 or one o'clock in the morning, getting in a Jeep together with these border police soldiers and driving into uh, a small village uh, just outside of uh, the city of Janine in the Northern West Bank. Um, and when we got there, it was a short drive. When we got there, we got out of the cars, we uh, divided into small teams uh, and we were given a list of coordinates, which are basically people's addresses uh, and sent to, to go knocking on those doors. And I remember going, I remember the adrenaline of this kind of late night excursion into a Palestinian village, um, uh, running to the, to the first house and the commander banging on the door um, and the, uh, uh, the household owner uh, opened up and was obviously uh, horrified or shocked uh, or petrified to see um, maybe eight or nine heavily armed um, IDF personnel 
uh, with you know all of our protective gear and our helmets on our heads and our rifles and everything. Um, and the commander of the force said to him, uh, go wake up all of your family. We want to see everyone. Um, and the person was obviously very obedient. He immediately went, uh, woke up his family members, brought everyone downstairs uh, to the entrance of the house. And the commander started asking a list of questions. What are your names? What are your ID numbers? What do you, um, where do you send your kids to school? What, I don't know, uh, all sorts of very standard questions like that. Uh, and while this um, kind of interrogation was happening, uh, I remember looking at this scene. I was kind of at the, I was at the back of this group of um, uh, border police soldiers. And I remember looking at the family that, were, that was in front of my eyes um and and seeing just a regular family uh with little kids there were maybe uh, i think maybe a 6 year old and an 8 year old um and i i remember um just looking at looking at them at their eyes and thinking they are they're terrified of us and they don't know that we are not here to hurt them for they know we're you know we're going to do some harm, but no one's actually told them that we're that everything's okay. We're not here to uh, to hurt them, and I wanted to somehow communicate that to them, um, and uh, and I I realized that there was no real way of doing that um, because I don't speak Arabic and I I was at the back of this group and I don't really know what goes on in these missions, uh, and my only real way of communicating that to them was just through my body language and just smiling just trying to to show them that it's going to be okay uh, with my facial expression and um and i smiled at them and and they didn't smile back um they gave me this piercing stare of um anger and hatred and i i remember um that moment being kind of a, I think of it as, as like a crack uh, in, my, in my story, because until that moment throughout my childhood and definitely in my uh, training uh, throughout my army service, I was, we were all told and we kind of all brought up with this notion that the IDF is a moral um, army and we do whatever we need to do in order to protect Israeli citizens. We do whatever we do for security reasons, even if somehow, sometimes it, it brings us into unpleasant situations, uh, we, we only do it for uh, security. And I remember that moment looking at those kids' eyes and thinking, there's nothing security related about this. Uh, and um, uh, that kind of changed everything. Because that understanding that this wasn't going to protect any of my friends or family in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and Haifa, um, but in, in, in fact, maybe, maybe this, at, during this moment, I've actually done the opposite. And maybe we radicalized these kids uh, and, and turned them against us in a way that perhaps they didn't feel before. Um, and that was that feeling went with me and stayed with me until much later. Uh, and especially when I realized that um, mapping missions are done by definition, uh, are uh, performed or executed on families which are not suspected of anything. These are by definition innocent people. Um, and and, and the reason that we do it, according to the military, apart from because we want to co supposedly collect information, is because we want to show them who's boss. And that was the uh, um, command that we got from our, our company commander um, bef before going on that mission, that we need to go in the middle of the night and not during the, middle, not during the day, because by going into that village in the middle of the night, we're not just waking up that family, but we're waking up... Um, you know, the whole village and showing them uh, who's in charge. And that's our way of keeping the Palestinian population under control uh, when we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have a social contract. We don't, they don't, we don't give them a reason to 
um, um, to, to live under our, um, our authority uh, other than intimidation and violence. Um, and I, I realized that there was something about that moment where I just experienced it once, but uh, this is something that happens every single day and every night in the West Bank. Um, I think that was a moment that, that a few years later brought me to breaking the silence uh, and to speak about my um, experience. And Breaking the Silence is an organization that collects testimonies uh, of soldiers uh, who served in the West Bank and the, the Gaza Strip. Uh, and I, I thought maybe I'd contrast my experience uh, with a, a different testimony from a different soldier who I don't know. Um, and uh, this is actually a Purim related testimony. Uh, and I think it kind of instructs, uh, it, it can tell us something about different forms of violence. Uh, and from there I'll conclude. So, um, sorry, I'll just I'll just read this testimony. Um, maybe I can, I'm not sure if it's actually necessary to share the screen. Um, it, this is a testimony from um, a first sergeant ser serving in the 932nd Battalion uh, in 2014 in Hebron, which is uh, the biggest city in the West Bank outside of uh, East Jerusalem. Um, so the interviewer asks the testifier, did you have instances of friction with the settlers or di dialogue with the settlers? And the soldier says, on Purim, all the religious guys are drunk, all the children, everyone got drunk, and we had to be on high alert because that's when they cause problems with the Palestinians. And the interviewer says, were you brief that they would be drunk, that you would have to? The soldier says, yes. It's also a day when the Palestinians want to attack because it's a holiday. Everyone, everyone's happy and drunk. It's a perfect time for an attack, but it's also a perfect time for some drunk to do something stupid. What really bothered me was that at night behind Beit Hadassah, which is part of the settlement, there was a post overlooking the roads. Everyone gathered there, all the people from Kiryat Arba and those settlements, they came there and began to throw glass bottles. They threw glass bottles for hours at the Palestinian house. There were only bars on the windows, no glass windows. All the broken glass fell inside. Babies were crying from within the house and all the children were peeping out and bottles were flying at their faces. They, the settlers, threw bottles uh, down below too at all of the houses on the streets. They did it for years, uh, sorry, they did it for hours and we tried to stop them. But as a soldier, you're not a policeman. There was nothing we could have done. We couldn't do anything to them. They threw them and I was very angry. The other soldiers were very angry. It got really bad. We said to the officer, do something, do something. And he said, there's nothing we can do. I'm sorry. It went on and they tried to cross the fence and go down to the Palestinian side. The settlers, yes. We barely managed to prevent them from doing it. They continued to throw bottles. They reached the people's houses, breaking the, their belongings vandalizing their property. Eventually the police came, the policemen and their friends. These are friends of their families. Everyone knows one another. They didn't do anything, they just watched. They said, okay, maybe take it easy. Maybe stop doing that. Maybe as if they didn't really show up with power. They just said, uh, they just came as if they're all friends with one another. They, the police don't care. Ultimately the platoon commander said, get back to the Mitkanim base. He told us to head back because he saw how much it bothered us, but we were limited. We couldn't do anything. Um, the interviewer says, before telling the story, you said that you were briefed. They told you that the settlers might do this and that. The soldier says, yes. The interviewer, in the briefing, didn't they tell you that uh, what you were supposed to do when you see something like that happen? And the soldier says, no, nothing. The rule is to protect the Jews. They focus more on the Palestinian reaction, not the Jews' actions. That's what they said when we did it. Interviewer, but aren't you supposed to protect the Palestinians as well? The soldier says, no, not at all. That's not the mission. The sole mission there is to protect the Jews. The Palestinians don't matter at all. They made that clear. Who is they? The soldier says, the company commander, everybody. Um, that's the testimony. Um, I'll put a link to it. Um, from our website uh, in the chat in a minute, but maybe I'll just, um, I'll conclude. 
um, with a, a thought about, you know, my reflection on on my service was that there was something about the um, uh, the the visible and the invisible violence, which um, which I said before, it features in lots of different ways. And um, when I was serving on the border of Gaza. Um, the the idea of what we were doing to Gaza by keeping it kind of in keeping uh two million people inside uh the walls of uh you know like almost a caged area that we'd um uh, uh set up um felt very abstract and it was very easily justified for security reasons like we justify everything um and uh, and it was only something that I thought about every now and then, even though physically my base was about 10 or 20 meters from the Gaza uh, uh, border. And uh, when I um, when I was posted in the Janine district, suddenly I I met hundreds of Palestinians a day. Uh, and there was something about suddenly um, seeing people uh, and seeing these faces of people who uh, reminded me in many cases of people I knew in my life, uh, people who were the age of my grandparents. Um, it was it was for me uh, humanizing. And I think the, the turning point for me wasn't specifically that um, night uh, when I went on the mapping mission. It was just these kind of human encounters that I had with hundreds of people uh, in my time serving on that base, uh, and uh, uh, and it made it much more difficult to perceive everyone as an enemy, which is the way we're told we should, uh, but rather um, uh, they were, you know, people who needed to live their lives just like I wanted to live my life. Um, and I, I urge us all to, in this time, uh, try to reach out and find the human stories from from Israel, from the Israelis who are also suffering from the occupation, and of course, uh, from the Palestinian side, from people within Gaza. There are some amazing uh, human stories that are being published about people's lives there. Uh, and, uh, and I think by trying to humanize this story and not making it abstract, uh, we can take at least a step towards trying to um, trying to bring this violent reality to an end. Thank you so much, Joel. I'm really, I'm very, um, I'm moved to know that this gathering serves, is serving you in some way and not just, not just us and Yasha Koch for, um, to your whole team at Breaking the Silence, everybody, if you don't have this book, um, our harsh logic, um, it's good to have on the shelf, but of course, um, many, many uh, Breaking the Silence testimonies are available um, online. Um, Yasha Koach, Joel, Rabbi Ariel, who's going to sing us out in a moment, Rav Aryeh, such powerful uh, Torah, and such important Torah. Um, on behalf of Rabbis for Ceasefire and uh, synagogues rising. I want to thank everybody here and and hundreds of people registered for this session. So we'll be sharing the link out um, and, uh, and and probably sharing on social media. Oh, Joel, you sent that just to me. Maybe you can um, put that to everybody. Um, um, and so on behalf, did I just say what it, I wanted to say? On behalf of Rabbi Spirit Ceasefire and Synagogues Rising, I want to thank um, all of you here today, all of you who will listen to this, um, um, for being here and for everything that you do to refuse to take the ring, to break this cycle um, of violence. Um, I'm just going to, before I close, pass it back uh, to Rabbi Ariel, just wanted to close with these powerful words that I just saw um, on. Um, that uh, Raphael uh, Madrig, I think I wrote his name on Facebook this morning, and I'll read it, and then we'll 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 close. 
As I understand it, the message of today's fast, the fast of Esther, is do not imagine that you could be safe when others are unsafe. Our safety is always bound together across lines of power and privilege. The state and the empire do not protect us. Only we can protect ourselves through mass solidarity. Through gathering together, we can access a power greater than the might of armies multiplied a thousandfold. Can you read on? I'm not sure if I should say Chag Sameach, um, but I will. I hope that everyone has the Chag that is right for them uh, this year. Thank you so much, Rabbi Lana. Thank you for gathering us together. And we're going to, in just a moment, depart this space and re-enter our day. I want to ground us in the fact that it's not just Jews who are fasting today. We're inside of the month of Ramadan. And um, I was at an iftar dinner last night and shared that today was a fast day for Jews and this feeling of our traditions braiding together, of, of our prayers finding each other, of um, people reaching to each other. Um, in the narrowness of this moment um, and so just grounding us not just in the sp specific moment in the jewish calendar but also feeling our traditions um, and our people our bodies grounding in this moment so however it is that you're encountering this day whether you're fasting by refraining from food whether you're engaging with this with this fast day by learning or by dedicating yourself to justice um, I just want to offer this last moment of song as a chance for you to find your kavanah, to find your intention, to hold what you, you can carry from this hour of learning and sharing together as you move into your day. Um, may we see each other again soon. Ya la 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 yo. Hey.